When we think about Roman senators, we instinctively picture old men wearing togas and convening in the city of Rome in the time of the Roman Republic. But what we often tend to forget is that there was a second Roman Senate in the late Roman Empire. Indeed, when Constantine abandoned the old Rome to create his new capital of the Roman Empire, he also had the vision to make this new Rome, Nova Roma as it was called for a while, which would later become known as Constantinople, a city rivaling Rome itself. And in order to rival Rome itself, it is of course clear that it would need its own Senate. So let us then explore the history of the Senate of Constantinople, the Eastern Roman counterpart to the old Senate of Rome and find out what its roles were, where it convened and when and why it finally vanished. When Constantine decided to move the capital of the Roman Empire to the city of Byzantium in 324 AD, he offered Roman senators great incentives to join him in this new city, mostly in form of land and grain donations. And indeed many followed his call, as they saw great possibilities in Nova Roma, a chance to be part of something new and grand. But many stayed behind and indeed the prestige of the old Senate of Rome would continue to eclipse the prestige of the new Eastern Roman Senate for more than 200 years after Constantine, until Justinian virtually robbed the Senate of Rome of almost all its power. But already in 330, when the grand dedication ceremony of Constantinople took place, we can assume that many senators had moved with Constantine to this new capital of the Roman Empire. Constantine already probably had the idea of a new Senate of Constantinople because he had two Senate houses built, one in his Oval Forum, the Forum of Constantine, and another one at the Augustaion, the rectangular forum between the Hippodrome and the new Imperial Palace complex. And so the senators of Constantinople, at least for a time, had the luxury of being able to convene in two separate Senate houses one more impressive than the other. Now towards the end of Constantine's reign, or early in the reign of Constantius II, the illustrious senatorial order was expanded to 2000 people. Of course, most of these were not actively convening and participating in the assemblies and decisions of the Senate. It must be also said that the same as the Senate of Rome in imperial times, the Eastern Roman Senate too, for the most time, did not wield great power. The Senate had legislative powers over the public games, the distribution of the Annona, the state-sponsored grain shipments, then of course power over the senatorial order itself, over treason cases, and the power to elect some magistrates, but that last part often only with permission of the Emperor. And in some cases, laws were drafted by the Senate and then issued, but again, only with permission of the Emperor. So the Emperor ultimately could overrule the Senate. Therefore, the power to be involved in the law forming process was only possible as long as the Emperor respected the Senate. Often the Emperor could also assemble the Senate and ask for its opinion on certain matters, a so called Senatus Consulta. But this too was of course done less and less often as the power of the Senate was suppressed more and more after the crisis of the 3rd century AD. But how was the Senate of Constantinople made up? Normally, the Praefectus Urbi of Constantinople, the prefect of the city, led the Senate, which is quite different from the Senate of Rome, where the Caput Senatus had the distinct title of Senate leader, a position which was normally not identical to the position of the prefect of the city of Rome. The late Roman Senate itself was composed of three orders, the Illustres, Spectabiles and Clarissimi. Illustres was the highest order and normally also the one that was actually convening and meeting in the Senate houses and discussing matters or laws. The Spectabiles was the middle class and the Clarissimi was the lower class. Members of these two classes normally were not active members, but just held the title of senator for prestige reasons as a secondary title. 
the lower classes too had a primary profession, such as for instance being a lower ranking official in the administration of the empire and then senator only second. And if you are like me a total Rome nerd or Romabu as some people like to say, and I think that you are or else you probably wouldn't be watching this video, then you might be interested in the incredible rings and other Roman accessories which the SPQR shop is building. They make legionary rings, they make rings with different themes, they even make coin replicas, statues, pendants, attributes and terracottas. And the most incredible thing is that they handcraft every single piece. That's right, this is really high quality handcrafted material. There is really no better present for yourself or someone you know who might be a Rome fan. I put the link to their shop in the video description and into the pinned comment. And with this link you can now even get a 20% rebate for every purchase. I repeat a 20% price reduction for every purchase from the SPQR shop. Which is just an absolutely insane offer. And you can only get it here via the Majorianus link. Because let me tell you the people from SPQR shop also are absolute fans of the heroic Emperor Majorian. So go and check out their incredible sortiment. There will be be certainly also something for you. The old titles of Aediles, Tribunes or Praetors had by the way already fallen out of use in the late 300s. Only Quaestor was still in use but only in the form of a provincial magistrate and that title too was disappearing quickly. And by the late 400s the lower classes were not permitted anymore to even participate in the senate meetings of Constantinople. So in the mid 6th century the number of the illustres, the highest order, had grown quite a lot. So that another order was created, the Gloriosi, which was comprised of only the highest ranking senators. Who would then naturally of course also hide the highest authority on decisions of the senate. Now interestingly. The Eastern Roman senators also wore the toga, the traditional dress of the Romans, which had largely fallen out of fashion already in the 3rd century, but which still had to be worn by law, as demanded in the Codex Theodosiacus, a code of law issued by the Emperor Theodosius. And interestingly this would remain so even well into the 7th century. At some point in the 7th century AD this changed then too as did so many other things in this great transition time of the Eastern Roman Empire towards what some call a Byzantine Empire, an Eastern Roman Empire of Greek cultural influence. Interestingly it was during a similar time that the Western Roman Senate dissolved for good. I talked about how, when and why the Senate of Rome disappeared in this video here. But even though the Senate of Constantinople normally did not wield exceptional power as the old Senate of Rome in the times of the Republic, it did have some impressive moments where it in fact did influence Eastern Roman politics in quite a big way. In 457 AD for instance the Senate of Constantinople did offer the throne of the East to the Magister Militum Aspar. Which must have been quite outrageous since Aspar was an Alani, a kinsman of the Vandals. Instead Leo became emperor who was a good emperor that tried to save the dying western Roman Empire and Leo later had Aspar executed in 471. Thus ridding the east from Germanic subversion, something the west unfortunately failed to do with Rikimer and so had to pay the ultimate price. So the decision of the Eastern Roman Senate to make Aspar Emperor seems really bizarre and was in my opinion really one of its absolute low points. In 464 there was a huge fire raging in Constantinople which destroyed or damaged many of the ancient buildings. The Senate House at the Forum of Constantine was most likely badly damaged in that fire. The damage of which could still be seen 500 years later as described by Constantinos of Rhodes in the 10th century AD. We don't actually know if that senate house was ever fully restored again or indeed if the senate ever convened again in that senate house. It was a very impressive building of round shape with four big porphyry columns at the entrance creating a portico and possibly the bronze doors of the entrance were the same ones of the Artemis temple of Ephesus 
which had been reused after that magnificent world wonder lay abandoned and possibly in ruins. And please consider supporting this channel via Patreon or YouTube membership because I really need your help in order to be able to continue this work on late Roman history. Without your support, I don't know how much longer I can continue this channel because as you can imagine, the YouTube algorithm does not exactly push a niche topic such as late Roman history. Thank you very much. During the Nika riots of 532 against Emperor Justinian then, the Constantinopolitan Senate, in another one of its rare moments of power, proclaimed their own counter-emperor to Justinian. Unfortunately, in the Nika riots, the second Senate house also burned down, which must have also been a very magnificent building. Justinian had it rebuilt, but in my opinion, in a less splendorous form, and also not as a separate Senate house anymore. It was then integrated into the Imperial Palace complex as a great reception hall. We can be quite sure that as a punishment for raising a counter-emperor against Justinian, the emperor did not give the senators a new separate senate house anymore. This building would later become known as the Magnaura. In 541, the numbers of the senate members started dwindling because of the plague pandemic that hit the Roman Empire brutally hard in both East and West. Many senators died and later Justinian had the wealth of many senators confiscated in order to bolster the disastrous finances of the almost bankrupt empire. During the reign of Phocas, most senators fled in order to save themselves from the brutal Phocas regime and they assembled in Carthage. In a noteworthy action, they elected Heraclius the Elder, the Exarch of Africa, as new emperor. Phocas was then later executed by Heraclius the Younger and Heraclius would turn out to be a great emperor, saving the empire from an otherwise possibly total defeat against Persia. The Senate of Constantinople would shine one last time. In fact, not only the Senate of Constantinople, but the order of the Senate itself as a whole. Because early in the reign of Constans II, when Constans was still only a boy, the Senate did in fact run the empire for a while. The Senate was for three years the official regent of this remnant of the old Roman Empire. So for the first time in 700 years, did senators actually run the state affairs again? But it would also be the last time. As I said before, this was possibly also the last time when the toga might still have been worn, but that old practice also died when the empire lost its old provinces of Egypt and the Levant to the Muslim Caliphate. Many customs that were still Roman died in those times. But even though the toga was not worn anymore in the 8th century, the Senate of Constantinople did still continue to exist. However, the Senate lost many of its old powers during the reigns of Basil I and Leo VI, so in the late 800s and early 900s. We could then say that the Senate transformed from an actual institution more to a class of dignitaries, where the title of senator was afterwards more akin to an honorary title. However, it was still prestigious to hold that title even in the 10th century. Even during the reign of Basil II, the Senate still existed. For instance, because Basil II and his brother Constantine VIII were too young to reign at first, it was the Senate of Constantinople who confirmed them as emperors with their mother as nominal regent, even though, of course, the real power was held by the Parakoimomenos, a Byzantine court position that normally only eunuchs could hold. But still, we see that even then the Senate still came into action from time to time. Of course, by that time, you would not have recognized a senator anymore as bearing even a remote resemblance to the senators of 400 years earlier. The toga was long gone, and by that time, the dresses certainly had a medieval character to them. The Senate still continued to play minor roles every now and then in the 11th century, sometimes confirming the rule of a regent, sometimes suggesting the rule of another. This would continue until then in the late thousands and early 1100s, under Alexius I Komnenos, 
the Senate really began to fade into irrelevance. The title of senator could from that time onwards even be bought from the emperor. In 1197, the Senate appeared again, but only because it refused to pay taxes. Thus, Constantinople was exempt from taxation, but the provinces had to be taxed even more, with, as you can imagine, sub-ideal results. The Senate's last known official act was to elect Nikolaos Kanabos as emperor in opposition to Isaac II and Alexius IV during the Fourth Crusade. Little good did it do to Nikolaos, because not long later he was executed by Alexius V. That was in 1204 AD. But even later, the title of senator still survived as a title. Even under the Palaiologos dynasty, you still could find one or the other person in the old bruised and ruined capital of Constantinople, amidst the crumbling ruins of old grander times that would hold this old illustrious title. But even that title then vanished for good in the crisis of the mid 14th century, around the year 1350 AD. And so then did the last vestiges of an ancient office vanish that had been founded by Romulus himself 2100 years earlier in Rome. With the end of the Senate of Constantinople, thus ended a 2100 year long history with many ups and downs, shifting power, intrigues, political power plays and many glorious returns to power. The Senate of the Romans was intrinsically linked to Romanness, but I find it fascinating that the last vestiges of that old senatorial order would survive almost until the fall of Constantinople itself. And please like and subscribe so that you won't miss any future videos on the fascinating era of the late Roman Empire. And please consider supporting my work on Patreon or via a YouTube membership because the long-term sustainability of this channel really depends on your support. This channel would not work without our amazing Patreon and YouTube members and I want to thank each and everyone who is supporting this channel in any form. And if you want to learn more about the state of the city of Constantinople in its prime, you can watch the video in the upper right corner. But if you want to learn more about how Byzantium probably looked before Constantine, you can watch the other video in the lower right corner. I say thanks again to all friends of Roman history, gratias Tibiago and bene valete.